Hi. <laughs> we are the greatest panel, too. We are. I'm Regan Morris. I'm with BBC News. And with us today, well, I can tell not the direction of this. We have three scientists. And we're going to do something different than what you've been seeing the last day and a half there. Because they have such different skills and expertise, they're going to give brief presentations with slides. We have visuals. And then we'll have a chat. But first, you're going to hear from them individually, because they really are unique, and they have different, different expertise that you'll be interested in. Uh, this is Tanya Domingo. She is, if you've all been hearing about scaffolding and talking about scaffolding, this woman knows about scaffolding. She, <laughs> I didn't know about scaffolding until yesterday. She, <laughs> oh, wow, sorry. She is an associate professor of biology and biotechnology at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And now we have Lauren Samuel. She is the Emerging Technologies Coordinator at Johnsonville LLC. And she's also a scientist. She has many years of experience in the meat industry. And we have Larissa Rudenko, who is a visiting scholar from MIT focusing on emerging technologies. So Tanya is going to go first. And we're going to sit back and watch her presentation for a few minutes and learn about her work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for inviting me. Uh, I am probably one of the few uh, tissue engineering folks in this room. Know nothing about food, but I know that my favorite vegetable, as you can see on this slide, uh, is a steak. Um, and so being uh, in tissue engineering field, though, uh, it, it becomes really interesting really quick that the platform technologies that we use in regenerative medicine, and that's what I do, uh, relies on, on two main components. Uh, we have heard before about uh, one is cells, the other one is structural support that we call scaffolds. And regardless of what we do with these two components, one of two products likely emerges. And in my field, uh, it's usually a product for regenerative medicine, so a nice skin construct for burn patients or a myocardial patch for uh, heart attack patients. But clearly, identical technology is being used today for, uh, for producing clean meat, clearly. Uh, so we have a lot in common, even though uh, we don't necessarily talk to each other. And scaffolds are really this complicated biomaterials or materials field. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with, with the composition, but uh, it's, it's very, very elaborate. There's a lot of synthetic polymers that are being used to grow things in three dimensions. There's a lot of natural polymers. Uh, but they, no matter how we use them, and you have heard Mark talk about it, it's none of these materials really have found uh, a way to build a vascular network of vessels that need to permeate the entire tissue in order to feed it and remove uh, all the bad stuff that comes with it. So they don't have uh, the vascular network. But if you look around, and the last time, I don't know if you looked at your uh, spinach salad carefully, but any, any plant structure uh, ha has inherent networks as well in order to feed its own tissue. And so we started thinking about uh, structures that are already present in nature that we could use as potentially not just a scaffolding, a structural support, but networks that can provide um, necessary, uh, oh, way too exciting, way too quick. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, it's probably pointing. Uh, so we started with spinach. If you just look on the left, this is what you get in the grocery store. It's plenty abundant. Um, you, you can eat it or you can just look at it. And it's really interesting because if you look closely, you can see this intricate network of channels that these leaves have. And we decided that maybe if we <clears throat> took this structure and removed all the plant material, so we remove all the green chlorophyll that's contained in the cells, remove all the protein and DNA, what we end up with, you can see on the right-hand side, it's really this translucent structure that still has all the structural support, and it has this vascular network. And the beauty of plant-based structures like this is they, they come in a variety of shapes, sizes, textures, you name it, and compositions. And on the bottom right, you can appreciate it. If one uh, would be so inclined to make a gigantic steak, you could do that too by choosing a leaf from a plant that is um, appropriate size. 
So it's really very available. So, but th does it really function? So w after we remove everything and then perfuse media through this decellularized scaffold, you can see that uh, the flow really recapitulates uh, what normally happens in any human tissue. So it remains patent. Uh, patent, uh, we, can, we can use it to deliver nutrients now uh, to where they need to go, much like a human tissue piece would. And just to, to convince you that the cells and these plant scaffolds actually do talk to each other. They don't hate each other, absolutely. We can make them love each other even better by modifying surface. Um, but we, we decided to put uh, uh, cardiomyocytes. Uh, those are heart cells that need to not only attach to this leaf that is now being fed through the vasculature, but continue to function. And this is really a good example where you can see that these cells not only attach, uh, but they, they function as well. Uh, this is, those are heart beating cells. Uh, on the right, you can see the calcium waves being propagated as the cells are contracting. So we, we really think that we are onto something here. Tissue engineering is inherently di difficult because we don't have vascular supplies. And maybe now, by bringing plants and animal systems into the same, into the same network, we might not be talking about now two fields anymore. We talked about plant-based products and clean meat. Well, maybe there's no comma between the two anymore. Maybe we have plant-based clean meat altogether as the third possibility. Thanks. Not sure what that was. All right, thank you. That was great, very interesting. And Lauren Samuel's gonna go next. Perhaps. Are we waiting for oh, this? There we go. No, that's mine. Wrong one. I'm on this side. <laughs> Are these Larissa's? Oh no, it's there, okay. I guess I'm on this side. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And when I was first asked to be on the panel, I was asked to provide a perspective from a meat scientist. And so before I do that, I wanted to just give you a little background um, to me to see where my perspective was coming from. So I'm a food scientist, and I, of course I looked up the definitions of food science, food science, and there's a lot of them out there. But the one that resonates um, most with me is around bringing together the different disciplines to really study the nature of food, study why it deteriorates, study um, creating great foods that consumers love. And then the Institute of Food Technologists has a mission statement, which I'm very much aligned to, which says a world where science and innovation are universally accepted as essential to a safe, nutritious, and sustainable food supply for everyone. And then at Johnsonville, my role there is to foster technologies that fuel growth with deliberate focus on solving challenging business needs, which enable safety, quality, sustainability, and innovation. So enabling technology sits within the R&D organization. And as we evaluate those technologies, we think about these criteria. So can it drive radical, radical change um, throughout the industry? Is it a potential solution to challenges and opportunities? It likely requires extensive research, and it likely requires collaboration across different disciplines and across different companies, different universities, institutions. So cell-based meat obviously fits within enabling technologies, and you know, thus our interest and our interest to learn more. As we've participated through this community and learned more about the technology, the question we pose is, will industry challenges be challenges for cell-based meat, or will cell-based meat be solutions for industry challenges? So those are some of the challenges that the industry faces today. And I'm hopeful that um, this technology is going to provide solutions to a lot of these challenges. So let's dive into a few of those. So the conversion to, of muscle to meat is a, a critical point in the process that results in either great quality product that consumers desire, or can result in a, in a poor quality product. Um, so Energy reserves in the muscle and the rate at which lactic acid and the pH decline are critical for the end meat product. So that all the factors on the left are impacting the factors on the right. 
And this point really results in whether you've got a, a meat product that is high quality, that's desirable by producers, customers, consumers, um, or a product that's of less quality. So an, an example of that is a, a large muscle in an animal that extends from the surface to, of the carcass to the bone will chill at different rates and therefore have different uh, pH decline curves. And because of that, the properties in the finished product are different. And that muscle often has a two-tone in color at retail display, which is an undesirable quality characteristic. So the question I have is, will, how will the conversion of cultured muscle cells to cell-based meat be designed and be designed to hopefully provide a solution to the challenges that are seen today? Moving a, a little further to raw material consistency, I think this was hit on a little earlier, is that there's a lot of inconsistency of raw materials today, whether it's animal to animal variation, uh, very differences in muscles that have different uh, myoglobin, heme proteins, connective tissue, there's differences in fat, there's differences in breed. So all of the differences in uh, raw materials results or can result in differences in finished products. So there's processes that are um, added to either reduce that variability or to improve the quality of, of certain muscles. So and an example of that is that muscles in the loin typically are more tender and have less connective tissue than, say, muscles in the shoulder. And they're used for different finished products, different, different finished products. So how will cell lines for cell-based meat be developed to meet the needs of consumer products and needs? Moving a little further, functional ingredients are often added to food products for many different reasons. They're, they're added for food safety, they're added for eating quality characteristics, for uh, color life, for um, flavor, and they have specific functions. And consumers across or consumers have been asking the food industry to reduce the number of ingredients in food products as well as use more recognizable ingredients. And the meat industry has been working diligently to meet this need. So how will cell-based meats utilize functional ingredients? Will there be the need for the same ingredients, for different ingredients, for more of the same, less of the same? And then often the ingredients used in food products um, dictate what types of consumer claims can be made. And there's a lot of different consumer claims uh, across all food products, and I've listed just a few here. So what will be the, the meaningful claims for cell-based meat, and what will consumers be interested in? Will they be interested in the ingredients used to grow cells just as they're interested in ingredients used in animals? And then finally, thinking about the whole food product development process, the raw material input, inputs are important, and it's important of how all those ingredients come together, how they're formulated into a product. The process design is critical. How, how much work is applied to muscle proteins impacts whether or not you have a high quality product that consumers crave, or you have a lower quality product. Sanitation design, Thinking about bacteria in the environment throughout the food, the entire food production process is critical. And then packaging technology, it's critical for, um, for food safety, for distribution, for display. So food and meat scientists, we have immense experience across the entire food chain, in-depth knowledge of our customers and our consumers, um, and expertise in creating safe, nutritious, craveable foods. So let's collaborate. Thank you. Um, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to stand because I, I fidget and uh, I don't think I've ever given a talk sitting before, so I'm, I'm Larissa Rodanko. Um, I'm currently a visiting scholar in the program on emerging technologies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a, a trade school on the other side of the ocean, uh, of the continent, ra rather. And uh, before that, I spent uh, about 15 years at the FDA working with my colleague Eric Schulze, who you may have heard of. 
and uh, looking at animal biotechnology. And then before that, I've spent really all of my life looking at, all of my professional life, looking at how to regulate uh, and, and develop governance strategies for new foods, new biologics, public health products, environmental health products, and how to sort of use the existing regulatory and legal structures in a way that sort of maximizes the ability to move forward without actually bending any, breaking any rules. So I, I, I facetiously titled this Cicero's Lament. And you will remember from Latin class that uh, the, his lament was O tempora, O mores, just O oh, the times, O oh, the customs. And, and the sort of equivalent of this from a song across the bay when I was young was the times they are changing. So things are changing. We used to have Barnum and Bailey animal crackers with the animals behind uh, bars in a zoo, and the new animal, Bar uh, Barnum's Animal Crackers, has wild animals walking loose. So the way we think about animals changes. Don't they look nice, those nice animals? All right, so, um, hello. I am technologically challenged. I am learning. Ah, there it is, all right. I'm looking over there, okay. Things to think about. So here's, here's what I want us to think about during this, this particular session. So where are we in the evolution of this technology? We've been talking about it all along. Some people think of it as pretty mature. Some people think of it as being in its infancy. It's probably somewhere uh, closer to the, its infancy than to its maturity. And I think because of that, we need to have realistic expectations about the technology. Your first products are not going to be your best products. They never are. Your first products are what are going to get you in the door. And then after that, you're going to keep working to improve and refine them. Where are we in the public's eye? Uh, Mark Post mentioned that we have a, a responsibility as well to social issues. One of the things that I work at, uh, I'm working on now at MIT, is how to get science-based concerns and values-based concerns to come together so that the values-based concerns don't co get conflated with safety concerns and emerge on the regulators at the moment of regulatory approval, and then you have all kinds of unintended consequences. So for those of you who don't think that regulatory policy is important to you as you develop your products, I just want to bring up the case of Aqua Advantage Salmon, which was approved by the agency on one day, and three days later, Congress passed a law saying that those fish could not be imported or sold in the United States because they didn't have the appropriate label on them. That was attached to an appropriations writer. That writer is still in place. So Aqua Advantage has an approval, can't sell their fish. Okay, important to remember. So are there useful parallels or precedents that help us or hurt us here? I'll be talking a lot about what you folks often refer to as GMOs, but as a former regulator, I can't. I refer to them as genetically engineered organisms, which is technically what they are. And uh, how do we talk to different audiences? And do the same words mean different things to different people? When you use a phrase like substantial equivalence, that may mean one thing to one audience, and it means a completely different thing to regulators or to lawyers who are looking at regulatory issues when you, if you're talking about substantial equivalence. If you're talking about clean meat, what does that mean? What is a clean label? Who regulates those labels? Is it FTC? Is it FDA? Is it USDA? You need to be aware of those things because you have, may have multiple jurisdictions that are looking at these. And finally is the all, all omnipresent Rumsfeld quote. What are the things we don't know that we don't know about? So how are these things important for things like biosecurity? Have we thought about that in terms of the security of the food supply and general pathogen dispersal um, with nefarious actors? Okay. Hello. I'm still challenged. Okay, so another thing I wanted to talk to you about was product versus process regulation. In the United States, we regulate products regardless of how they're made, although the manufacturing process plays a large role in how we regulate things. So product-based regulation is generally based on broadly written statutes, such as the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which says that food must be safe. Um, modification of the basic statute does not require new legislation, so we like to have it written very, at a very high altitude. We do case-by-case -case reviews, including experimental and investigational uses, so even if you're working on something in the experimental stage, you are covered by the law. You're not just playing around in the lab. 
These, this kind of an approach tends to be a little more flexible and adaptable because it doesn't require rewriting a directive every time a new product comes along. <clears throat> it's possible to generate a whitelist, in other words, a list of safe and approvable kinds of substances to use. Um, it's not dependent on an a priori set of regulations as opposed to laws. Uh, but it can leave investigators and the public wishing for norms. Sometimes people don't understand that the law always holds, and so they think that clean meat or plant-based meats are not regulated, when in fact they are. They're always regulated. The law is always there. So pro process-based regulation sometimes is, is more acceptable to the public because it's, t it's specific for a particular regulation, uh, for a particular technology. Um, uh, but the downside is that you may need to issue a new directive or a new piece of legislation to move to another technology. Now, my understanding is that in Europe, uh, clean meats and uh, plant-based meats are regulated under the Novel Foods Directive. Um, so there you have a nice umbrella uh, to cover these things. Um, the downside is if you're talking about an emerging technology, you may solidify the regulations a little bit too early. And so you, you sort of the unintended consequence of that is that the developers are a little bit boxed in and can't move as the way they'd like to. Um, and, but the upside is that the public may feel that the government's on top of it. And it comes from a basic misunderstanding of the fact that the law always holds in process, in product-based regulation as well. So it's a perception issue, not an actual issue. So the regulatory tools we have in the U.S. is we have a statute, we have, uh, which, has, which is the law. If you break the law, you're in deep doo-doo. Um, we have regulations which have the force of law. Those are issued by regulatory agencies. Statutes are obviously issued by Congress. And then we have guidances, which are the agency's best thoughts at the time. They're non-binding recommendations for how to submit data and information to the agency on, uh, in data packages that they're going to review. So what's gone before? I said I would talk to you a little bit about uh, genetically engineered organisms, and I'm not talking to you about them because I think that you're using genetically engineered organisms. I'm talking to you about them because I think there's some important take-home lessons here. So one of the very first things that, we, uh, that was uh, regulated by the uh, Food and Drug Administration was microbially derived chymosin. Uh, that has gotten generally recognized as safe status, which means it's not technically approved. It is simply recognized as safe. It's grown uh, in multiple different microorganisms, and I think there are three or four different uh, grass um, affirmations that are present. The flavor saver tomato, which was a commercial disaster for so many reasons, actually established two incredibly important precedents for us to look at. The first is that the Calgene asked for a scientific advisory opinion from the agency as to whether or not this genetically engineered tomato was still a tomato, because there was a question of whether if you were modifying something, if you were engineering something, did you alter its essential state? Did you alter its telos, as a philosopher might say? And the agency, which is not known for being terribly philosophical, but uh, does have decent science and, and uh, legal chops, came back and said, yeah, it's still a tomato. It's still a tomato. And then they issued another uh, a, a policy statement in 1992 about advanced plant breeding and basically said that genetically engineering plants was just another form of breeding and that corn was still corn, maize, soy was still soy, everything was still what it was. So this is an important take home message for everyone here who's making these kinds of products. Um, they also issued a food additive petition for the canamycin resistance selectable marker gene. Um, that was a pre-market approval. So when this, mar when this tomato was ready to go to the market, it had the full impact of the approval of the United States government. What they didn't have was good business sense about what kind of tomato to put this in. I want to bring up something else. On the bottom here, we have seedless watermelon. This is a triploid uh, fruit. Um, it is generated by using various interesting breeding techniques. It receives absolutely no further regulatory scrutiny from USDA or FDA just because it's triploid. So that just comes on the market without any problems at all. Now we have various other commodity crops. We have soya, we have corn. They have various approvals from EPA and USDA depending on what their traits are and voluntary consultations at the agency. What has gone before with animals? 
Well, the first thing we have is animal cloning. As you may know, somatic cell nuclear transfer is a way of introducing the nucleus from a diploid animal into an enucleated uh, immature oocyte, treating that fusion, and then hoping that something de-differentiates sufficiently and then re-differentiates into a, a full-grown animal. And we have a picture of Dolly and, uh, and her sexually reproduced offspring, Polly, standing next to her. I had the good fortune to actually meet Dolly at one point. She was a very nice animal. Um, she did, however, eat my scarf. So, I don't know. Um, but the important thing there was the agency developed a risk assessment to determine whether or not food from clones or their sexually derived offspring required addition, re, additional regulatory approval. And after a thousand pages that Tanya knows about, uh, we uh, came to the conclusion that there were no significant biological differences in the composition of the food or the health of the animals uh, provided that, uh, that exceeded those um, that were different in kind uh, from those that you might see with any other assisted reproductive technology. So um, what the, the, the precedent that this establishes is how to do a compositional analysis of meat and understanding what's important in meat for, from the agency's perspective, both with respect to sort of biological equivalence, notice I'm not talking about substantial equivalence, and what's an important dietary contribution. The USDA has a wonderful database that lists major and minor and moderate contributors to the diet from various food products. So you wanna make sure that those are addressed in whatever product you're making so that people who eat whatever it is that you're making have an expectation that they're gonna get the appropriate nutrition out of it and that they do. And finally, I've told you the story of the Aqua Advantage salmon. So let me just try to get past this. The last thing, again, as Tanya has said, is regenerative medicine has told us a lot, or is, is telling us a lot, and is co-developing at the same time that a lot of clean meat materials do. And that's one of the reasons why FDA has said that it thinks it may have the expertise to do the safety assessment on clean meats, because it's very familiar with the kinds of tissues and cell regeneration and regenerative medicine. So finally, I want to talk to you about what are the range of governance and regulatory approaches that exist. Across the Bay, we have a lot of permissionless regulation. This was, let's go build something, let's move fast, break things, build wonderful things, and we don't need to have any upstream regulation of this. And everything was fine until Cambridge Analytica. So now things have changed a little bit. But they do range from preventative, in which we really don't want this technology, we're not gonna put it on the market, we're not gonna let you develop it because we think it's dangerous, and that can apply to dual use pathogens or chemicals that are, we have the precautionary principle, which has lots of different shades and colors, we have permissive, which looks at different risks that are involved, and then we have promotional, which is a little more forward than simply being promotional. Now the big difference here is in preventative, the burden is on the producer to demonstrate a lack of significant harm. And the liability accrues to the producer in the event of a harm. Permissionless, the burden is on the regulator to demonstrate that there's likelihood of harm prior to regulating. Now there's a school of thought that that is, has, been has been a proponent of this for quite some time. I don't know where we're gonna end up on this, um, but it's important for you to understand the range of regulatory systems that are in place. And then, uh, you know, depending on what side of the, of the story you sit on, you can use emotional arguments to polarize things. And as we've said before, there are social things you need to worry about, not just science things that you need to worry about. Uh, we've, the important thing here is we talk a lot about this is as safe as, this is the same as. What is your comparator? Okay. What are you going to use as a comparator? Are you going to be using New Zealand lamb as your comparator? Are you going to be using grain-fed beef as your comparator? Are you going to be using grass-fed meat? It matters because the composition of the, of the resulting tissue will differ depending on what that animal has been exposed to. So be very careful when you choose your comparator and when you're saying it's the same as everything else. Um, and then we have a pacing problem. The pacing problem is, is the public ahead of the science? Is the public behind the, tech, the science? Is the science ahead of the technology? Is the technology ahead of the science? You know, and where are we right now? It's important not to let any one component get too far ahead of the other, or you run into problems like the Equa Advantage salmon did. 
So the important that there's some take home messages here I'm wrapping up. You have to understand the box, but you need to learn how and when to think outside it. The box is there for a reason. Regulatory structure is there for a reason. They're comforting. They're lawful. They, you must obey them, OK? And it's scary outside the box because, as Dipti will probably tell you later on, it, the minute you start moving outside the established precedents that have been put forward, it gets a little complex, and you have to determine how far you're actually deviating from the intent of the law and the regulation. So you have to learn the box's rules. When the agency asks for comments on clean meat and gives you a list of questions, don't write in and say, we think this is really important because I really like it and we need to eat less meat. They're asking you for a set of questions that they want answers to. And they will get through those comments faster if you answer their questions instead of providing 100,000 uh, clicks on something that says, we like clean meat, or we think we should be eating plant-based meat. Because by law, they're required to look at all of them. And if you want this to move ahead, make it easy for people to, to analyze what's going on. Answer the agency's question. Write the appropriate submissions. Make sure you get the right material. You know, sometimes the agency doesn't have a problem with the safety of something. Sometimes the agency has a problem with your submission. So make sure you know what your submission is doing, doing the right things. And if you can't do any of these things, then you have to move very, very carefully. Talk to agencies early. I don't care if it's USDA or if FDA or EPA. You've got to go talk to them early. You might even think about talking to the Federal Trade Commission about labeling kinds of issues. So you want to make it easy for people to say yes. And I do think, unlike this cat, you, mess, you must be able to think outside the box. And so finally, I want to end with two quotes. One is from Ash Carter, who's the former deputy, the former Secretary of Defense uh, under President Obama. And his comment was, the progress of science and technology is unstoppable, but its arc is unknown. And we are somewhere here in the beginning of this arc and this technology. And the other one is from Sheila Jasanoff, my colleague up the river at that other school, uh, the other trade school for government employees called the, the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and, and she is a, the founder of the science, technology, and society field. And one of the things that she likes to say is that we need to get involved in this very early on. The public needs to have a place and a mechanism to have conversations about not just the science, but the ethical issues. And she says that our inventions change the world. And the reinvented world changes us. So as we all sit here thinking about how this food is going to change the world, let us also think about how that world is going to change us and how we move forward from it. Thanks. All right, well, can you hear me? Yeah. I wanted to ask you all, I know you've been here a day and a half. And we've learned a lot about you. You've learned a lot more about the industry over the last day and a half. Is there anything that you've seen that the industry should be learning from academia? What should they be looking at? Do, uh, what skills, what lessons, or do you think they're making any mistakes? Or what challenges are they not thinking about? <laughs> Tanya? Excellent. Um... Well, we all recognize, and I continue recognizing more and more, that the uh, inherent need for interdisciplinarity is really paramount if we are going to make these new products that we strive for. Um, in my short presentation that I had, I didn't mention plant scientists, right? Clearly, we are working as a group a lot with plant scientists. Those are not food scientists. They're plant scientists. We work with biomaterials people, uh, mechanical engineers, something I haven't talked about. If we're going to make a real steak in a dish, not only do we need to make it complex and three-dimensional, we probably need to grow it under some kind of mechanical strain because muscle doesn't like just sitting there. It's going to atrophy. So the interdisciplinarity goes so broad uh, that we're all going to start identifying other disciplines that we need to help us what we do better and to really get rid of this box completely. There should be no box when we're thinking how to make these new products. What about yeah, you, Lauren? Is there I agree. Anything? And, and to build on that, I, I think it's, it's reaching out to the students that are out there that are interested in engaging in this field. Um, there's been some great opportunities over the last couple of years where uh, students in food science are learning more about this area. And there's a lot of interest from them. And engaging those that are, are interested 
um, can yeah, advance this field so much faster. So I think it's important to continue those conversations and finding the opportunities to make those connections. I think uh, my reach is even broader across, uh, inter uh, across disciplines. I'm, I'm trained as a heart scientist. I have a PhD in molecular biology, and I've recently started getting in, turned into a policy wonk and now really trying to understand the values-based concerns that we're running into. And so what I would urge uh, most graduate students and postdocs to do is take advantage of your science, technology, and society courses at your universities and take some courses in them. Um, the other thing that I would strongly encourage the developers to do is talk to philosophers and social scientists. There are a whole bunch of people who are working on foods and how we think about foods from an ethics and philosophical perspective. And you can learn a lot from them. So I would say, don't be limited. We've, we've had scientists talk. We've had business people talk. We don't have a philosopher or an ethicist up here. So I would suggest the next time we have one of these conferences, we have at least one scientist or ethicist. We have the religious uh, folks on board. But I think it would be really important to hear from people about how that entire discipline views this. And it may help us with our pacing problem. Because there are so many people uncomfortable with it or, and, and not oh, knowing what so it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. how many of us has, have asked, you know, okay, we don't want to have so many animals on the face of the planet. Well, what are we going to do with those breeds? You know, that's the other side of the question. You know, are, those, are we going to keep them, some, somebody said, as, as pets? Or um, are we going to just keep small numbers of them? There's the horse example that I guess it's Eric and the horse he rode in on. Um, so um, what are we going to do with those animals? That's an ethical question that needs to be asked. May not, the ethical answer may be we need to decrease the carbon footprint on the planet, but what do you do about those breeds and species? Interesting. And uh, Tanya, you were just speaking about all the different disciplines, people who would have, should come into the industry, yeah. different engineers. I had never thought about I'm not a scientist, and I haven't thought about the steak, growing a steak. The steak needs to exercise. Like, I had never even considered that as an option. What does that look like? And I'm wondering if that even exists. Is that... Well, it's interesting when you, uh, as a tissue engineer, you build uh, skeletal muscle, which steak is, but we build skeletal muscle for patients who have lost a massive part of a muscle because of an injury or uh, in a war situation. Developing muscle tissue relies heavily on mechanobiology. The bioreactors in which we can grow these tissues uh, have either uniaxial stretch built into the bioreactor, so you are constantly exercising the muscle. That gives it uh, alignment of cells. You know, the nice texture that the meat has comes also from alignment. Alignment comes from mechanical mechanical stretching as well. Uh, and it's, it's really important. So design of a bioreactor, if we're gonna be building these complex tissues, is really, is really, really critical. Uh, I think clean meat uh, is gonna fall into two main categories. Uh, if we are doing um, cells into meat product, so ground, ground beef or sausage-like presentation or any kind of, uh, texture that does not have to look like a steak, then we're, we can simplify bioreactors quite a bit. But if the goal in the end is to really produce something that's, that's going to taste and feel and, and, uh, and, and look like a steak, bioreactor is going to have to be very, very different. May I just make a comment here? I think it was Uma who said that we should maybe not talk so much about bioreactors, but, but cultivators. And, and I think yeah. here's a classic okay. example of how we talk about things makes yeah. a difference about how they're perceived. I know we had somebody do a pitch about brewing beer next to culturing sausage or something like that. But yeah. bioreactors are good to talk about in the biomedical field. Cultivators may be better ways to talk about growing steaks and growing meats. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Uma. <laughs> so many people talk about clean meat, though. I mean, I'm not convinced anyone outside the industry will be calling it clean meat, though. And ultimately, people are going to call it whatever it is. I mean, a lot of people want it to be called meat. What do you think, Lauren, from the business community? 
that the, from, the, from the more traditional meat industry, that they're gonna be looking for in a clean meat product? Will it be ingredients or is it, what do you think their interest is mainly? Because it's, a lot of them are very against it, obviously, but you wanna collaborate, you, you think there's a lot of open-minded people open to this. Yeah, absolutely, we wanna definitely collaborate. And you know, as I think about clean meat and the, I'll say the, the functionality, I think a lot about the functionality and how the material is going to perform as a food product. And so whether that's the sensory characteristics, the, the way it functions through the processing. Um, Tanya was just talking about the stretching of the muscle. How much that muscle is stretched is gonna impact the eating quality, like how tender is that muscle or how tough is that muscle. And so those are the things that I'm thinking about of just how, does, how do the characteristics translate into a great product that consumers want and that um, those producing the food products, if it's an ingredient, are looking for. So is the, is the material um, great for, for binding with other ingredients, with fat, with moisture, and all the characteristics that um, people are craving in those food, food products, the, the mouthfeel, the bite, um, so those are the things that I think about when you know, I'm thinking about um, cell-based meat and what that material will look like. Well, we have uh, a few questions. There's, somebody wants to know, raw milk is available for retail sale in some states as pet food. Would this be a way for clean meat to hit shelves sooner under current regulations? Um, I'm, I'm not sure who would want to market their clean meat as pet food, but... <laughs> uh, Pet foods are regulated by the Division of uh, Animal Feeds at the Center for Veterinary Medicine at FDA. Uh, milk is regulated jointly by USDA, FDA, and the states under the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance. And currently FDA is concerned about the pathogen load in raw milk, and so there are some issues about that. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I uh, I would not take that route if I were <laughs> developing big But that's just my opinion. <laughs> and what what skills from academia? I'll ask. Uh, I'll start with you, Tanya. You know, you said all different disciplines and whatnot. Do you think? from the way your lab works in a, do you think there's lessons learned that the, the meat industry here should be learning about what they're using, mainly in media? There's a lot of talk about media, what goes into it and whatnot that the medical field has already answered and the clean meat industry may not realize? Uh, there, there may be. I may not be specifically aware of any major uh, major advances. Uh, one of the big things that we heard um, from Mark, I believe, too, was the removing the serum, the need for serum component, 10%, 15% in some uh, cultivating conditions. Uh, eliminating that is, uh, is, is huge, and I don't believe as a field that we have found a reasonable solution. In regenerative medicine, what we have done, because that's how you do it, you replace cow serum with human serum, of course, you're making a product for transplantation. Uh, but we know that that's, that's a big problem. What I think regenerative medicine has done, though, uh, that could be used in meat, uh, uh, in meat, uh, clean meat industry, uh, is three-dimensional systems and, and how to assemble, and mechanobiology that I mentioned briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those two fields, biomaterials, bio-inspired design, in three-dimensional structural support uh, is at a well-advanced stage in regenerative medicine that I think the field would definitely uh, benefit from. And of course, you know, cell biology, uh, what kind of meat we're gonna have depends on the cells that we're gonna use. Uh, and cell behavior uh, has been researched for a number of different cell types in regenerative biology. Mm -hmm. And we, we heard earlier about, uh, I think it was Nia on the last panel, one of the CEOs. You know, she was saying she had 10 years experience in agriculture and was saying she thinks the industry should be more looking at, you know, going parallel and working with the feed. And, and can you, Lauren, do you know anything about 
how the meat industry works and would there be ways in which the actual industry could contribute in a collaborative way in the feeding of the cells. And it, it seems, you know, the traditional agriculture feed and then becoming the same business, a spinoff. Yeah, I, I am less familiar with, with that part of the industry, so I can't talk in any okay. details about it, but I, I think absolutely it, it makes sense. Um, there's a lot of, of the same components that um, are feeding animals to feed cells. So I think it makes absolute sense to look towards that industry. And from a regulation standpoint, it'd probably make it, would that make a difference if it was already established industries working toward, do you think that would change? Because they already know what they're doing with the USDA, with the FDA, these established. I, I think we need to let the regulators sort all of this out and not speculate on where it's going to go because I think it'll just, I think we need to be prepared for a lot of eventualities, but let the people whose job it is do that job and uh, provide them with the help and advice that they need, but they're gonna be the decision makers at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that has, a, yeah, a lot of people that I've spoken to here are concerned, just not knowing how it can work, how you're gonna get the product out there. It's so interesting. And for academia, you're all scientists, Coming in, what lessons do you think the industry can learn from you that they, that they haven't yet, that you haven't heard? Have you already answered that? You've answered that somewhat. But I guess the, the, the interdisciplines that you're not seeing. Maybe, maybe opportunities like this. So this is my second conference. I, I kind of fell into this field of clean meat. Uh, by complete accident. We were, we were designing tissue engineering uh, uh, structures for heart patients. Uh, but I think opportunities for people uh, to meet in these, kind of, in, in these kind of forums is really important. This is very unusual. We all tend to go, at least in academia, you go to your discipline-specific meeting. I go to regenerative medicine and tissue engineering meetings. I don't even go to plant biology meetings much less mechanical engineering, biomaterials, uh, electrical engineering wouldn't cross my mind, right? Or product design packaging. I mean, we're talking about so many different things that all have to come together if we're gonna really develop a new product, a new food type, and, and so many things go into it. So creating opportunities for this to happen uh, more often than once a year, right? Inertia uh, is, is really important, and uh, if, if, you, if you don't maintain enthusiasm about a field in a regular and frequent manner, I think it, it's gonna start losing the allure and the opportunity. That would be my, my advice. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, there's a lot of tools that are utilized to understand food products and tapping into those techniques, whether it's, it's, it's juiciness, it's tenderness, the sensory characteristics um, that are all you know, out there to tap into and be utilized um, in academia and within industry. Again, I, I would take us even farther afield than academics. I was particularly struck by the talk yesterday about the oceans and fisheries. Mm -hmm. And I, I, have, I have a little bit of a problem because you know, there are a lot of uh, celebrity chefs who really uh, emphasize catching, eating, cooking wild caught fish. They're so much better than farm fish. And my concern has always been, well, what are you gonna do when you catch the last fish? Um, so I think, it, I think it's wonderful that we had a pitch from somebody who was a chef. Um, and I would encourage us to talk to people at the food, I, I don't know what you call that industry, but the restaurant industry, the celebrity chef industry, and, and try to bring them along and educate them about the importance of this. As, and again, you're asking for some disruptive thought in that community. You're asking people to go from, you know, this is this kind of a meat or this kind of a fish and it's better because of whatever reason to this kind of a thing that's kind of a high tech. So you're asking them to go from a very low tech to a very high tech thing. And they may be uncomfortable. So maybe it's time to increase their comfort level with this. 
Thank you. I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you all. This was uh, really interesting, exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. That was great.